Matthew 6 and verse 5, the Bible reads, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. When thou prayest, I'm going to start a little series. Um, I don't know if I could ask for a show of hands if anyone is just like, man, I've got this prayer thing down. I know exactly what to do in the area of prayer. I've nailed it. I know all the doctrines. I know all, all the ins and outs of it. I, I think I would have a very limited amount of hands go up. Um, prayer is a very important and pivotal aspect of the Christian's life, but it's something that is often neglected because as you see, as we read through here, prayer is something that is specifically done in secret. It's something between you and your father. It's something that isn't showy, isn't outward, isn't something that everybody can grab a hold of. We like to do the works that are seen by everybody, unfortunately, just like the hypocrites here. But prayer is something that's neglected, and I think the main reason why is because we don't take the time to, first of all, do it, but second of all, learn about the doctrine of prayer and what it means to pray and to ask God and to seek God's favor and seek God's counsel and seek God's advice and seek God to move in your life. And that's simply what prayer is. It's, it's an asking. So the Bible starts, and in this passage, this is the end of the Beatitudes, when, when Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, explaining to people um, that are there and assembled on that mount different doctrines, foundational doctrines, to the faith. Many of these um, are, are far-reaching doctrines, and as he lays them out, it, it seems like he's taken something that was fairly simple and straightforward and made it nearly impossible. You know, over there in uh, 5 and verse 28, he says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. That was said of old time. He says, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So he takes something like, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, I can do that. I can stay away from the strange woman. I'm not going to find myself tempted. I'm not going to get in trouble in that way. But even to look upon a woman to lust after her with her heart is adultery? Wow. God, God then takes the letter of the law and extends it further to make it a heart matter to where even the act of, of indulging in a glance or a glare or a look can be the sin in and of the same. He makes the law, therefore, even exceeding sinful in the eyes of men and even more complicated, more difficult for us to keep were it not for the Spirit of God empowering us to do so. And in this context, he, he begins to explain to his disciples about prayer. And I love how he comes out right away there in verse 5. He says, and when thou prayest when thou prayest so here the when is not an if it's a when so so this is something that is taken for granted the christian the believer will pray and he says thou when thou prayest making it personal you know that these and thou's and ye's and you's are meant there in the bible in the king james bible to specifically give context to who's being discussed and who's being talked to when he says a thee or a thou that's personal that's pointed at somebody in particular when thou prayest now jesus is talking to me when thou prayest and that whole doctrine i like to say about prayer and I put in pray and an asterisk in my Bible search software. So I got prayest, pray, praise, and all the different various versions of the term prayer. And it came up 540 times in my Bible. So this isn't a minor doctrine. This isn't something that, that is just should be taken lightly. Now I understand that many of them 
include the, the term pray thee, or I, I pray, where men will just be asking, because that's all prayer means. It's just an asking. I ask thee, sir. I, ask, I, I request of thee. And, and that's what pray is used as. And then the first about you know 20 or so references to the word prayer, that's all men are doing. They're, they're praying other men. I, I pray thee, sir. I pray thee. I pray thee. They're asking other men. But when it finally gets to the point where men are praying unto God, which is what we're talking about here, the Bible says in Genesis 20, verse 17, So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed. So right away, the first mention of praying unto God gives the appropriate response, is that he prayed and God healed. He prayed and God did. So we don't need to think that prayer is something that immediately out of the gate is going to be always rejected or overlooked or not heard of by God. But rather, when Abraham here prayed, God healed. God did exactly what Abraham requested at this particular time. So don't faint. Don't be weary. Don't, don't be concerned that prayer then isn't something. It's ominous. It's never going to happen. We're never going to have our prayers answered. No, God is in the business of answering Christians' prayers. And this is why we need to be more bold in the area of prayer. And this is my whole focus in this, is that I know that myself included, I'm not as bold as I need to be in prayer. I'm not as attentive. I'm not watching there unto. I'm not doing all of the things that I would like to do in the area of prayer. And so I decided to just go and see, hey, when thou prayest. And take some teaching from Christ and see if he can give me some sort of insights about how and when and whys and the who's of prayer. And, and that way I can grow in this area. And I hope everybody else will as well. When do we pray? Luke chapter 21, verse 36 says, Watch ye therefore and pray always. Ephesians 6, 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, Pray without ceasing. So while it does say when thou prayest, and this is something that we would expect, okay, well then it would be something often, or something we do from time to time or periodically. The Bible is clear that it's, while it's not an if, it's also not just an often. The Bible and God wants us to pray always, pray always, pray without ceasing. And these are just a few of the examples of that very statement being made. Pray always, 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 always. So how? How do we always pray? Are we just to be one of them cloistered monks and just hide ourselves away in a cave and just pray all the time? And that's all we do night and day all the time, never ever stopping to do anything else? Well, no, we know the Bible even commands us to do other things. And even when we reflect on it, think about our own lives, well, we must go to work, right? We must communicate one with another. We must do various different tasks. God commands us to go out and to preach the gospel. Well, we're not necessarily praying at that time, are we? We've got to sleep, don't we? I mean, how in the world is somebody going to always pray, always pray without ceasing? Well, the main point that I like to grab a hold of is that prayer is not a posture. Rather, prayer is a position. See, a lot of people think that prayer comes, you know, only when you're down on your knee and you're saying, Dear God, I, I pray, God, that you would do such and such. And you're, you're reaching out to him in that area. But we know that it's, it's not in the posture because throughout the Bible, you're going to find men standing and praying. You're going to find men on their face and praying, on their knees and praying. You're going to find all different postures for prayer. And so it's not something that we need to basically go to and get into position. And now we are ready to pray. Rather, it is an all-the-time position, and I believe that's how it is best understood. You can keep your finger there in Matthew chapter 6. Go way back to the beginning of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, if you would. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. So then prayer, as I said, it's not that we go when we get into a specific posture, and now we're prepared to get a hold of God. No, prepare, I believe is, prayer is a position that we are essentially required to always being. We're always to be ready unto prayer. That's why the Bible says pray always. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop. Continue. Genesis chapter 3, the Bible reads in verse 8, And they heard, this is Adam and Eve, the voice of God, sorry, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So here Adam and Eve hear the voice. And if we know Genesis chapter 3, this is right after they had sinned. They found themselves naked. They made themselves fig leaves to clothe themselves with aprons. And it says, And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where, out, where art thou? 
So here God's voice is being heard in the garden. Adam and Eve hide themselves away. And God called out unto Adam specifically and said, Where art thou? So therefore we see this communication with God. And this is exactly what prayer indicates and what prayer is. It's a back and forth with God. It's us talking to him through our voice, through our meditations. It's him talking to us through his very word, through the voice of the Lord God, as it says here. So the position then that we ought to be in is first and foremost right with God. So we see then there was a disconnect, right? They had sinned. They ate of the fruit that it was commanded them not to. They realized they were naked. They had to cover themselves with their own good works, with their own manufactured apron. God's voice came in and they hid themselves from his presence. And if we're not right with God, we're not going to find ourselves in a position where we want to be in his presence often. So what we need to do first is get the house clean, get it swept, get it garnished. Start to reflect first, and I would say even in that place of prayer, upon the things that may be hindering us from having direct communication with God. The position of prayer then is one where we are right with God. We are in communication with Him. We're open to hearing Him and we're ready to respond unto Him. And here the, 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 the whole uh, back and forth, the whole idea of prayer is broken up and it's all because of the sin that they're in. The voice of God comes out. There's no response, but rather they hid themselves and it seems that it was expected that there would be a response because God calls out again after he had made his first statement. He says, where art thou? In other words, you're supposed to be here, Adam. Where art thou? And I like this statement that I often hear, uh, hear in association with that statement, where art thou? It's not that God didn't know where Adam was, but it's that Adam needed to know where Adam was. God wasn't, you know, where are you? You're hidden. I can't find you. God's everywhere, sees everything, knows everything. He had known that they had sinned. But he asked the statement, where art thou? So that Adam would reflect upon himself and upon his own heart position and condition. And then Adam would know where Adam's at. Adam would understand that he had sinned. Adam would understand that he's now hiding from the presence of God. And he needs to get back to that. Sometimes God asks us that same question. Hey, where art thou? Why aren't you praying unto me? Why aren't you seeking me? Why aren't you asking me? Why aren't you in communication with me? Where art thou? And we need to, as Adam did, God knows where we are, but do we know where we are? Have we accepted where we are? Do we embrace where we are? And are we ready to change where we are? And this is where the communication breaks down often, is that we have sinned, and while the best thing that we can do is confess our sins because he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness, we do what Adam did and we just hide ourselves away. And then one day without prayer becomes two days, becomes a week, becomes a month, becomes years go by where we don't pray actively and dedicatedly and devotedly unto God. But the Bible is clear. God doesn't ask us nor command us to do things that are not possible. We can pray always. We can pray without ceasing. And when this sin has been dealt with, and we are no longer separated from God in that fashion, whether it's real or supposed, whether it's the fact that God has actually separated from us, and he's not hearing us because of our sins, or whether we just think that that's the case, and therefore we don't seek unto him, it makes no matter. The end result is the same. But once we deal with that sin, we are now ready to be receptive to his word. And as his word enters in, prayer is simply us responding to it. God speaks, we respond. Sometimes we initiate the conversation, but he's always going to talk back within the context of Scripture. So if you go back to Matthew again, Matthew chapter 6, we're just going to look at a few quick points about prayer. Eventually, I'm going to look at that entirety of what some people call the Lord's Prayer, but I think my Bible rightly puts it in the upper uh, heading there when it says Christ teacheth us how to pray. It's not the Lord's Prayer, but it's, it's a model prayer, essentially. He's teaching the disciples how to pray. He's teaching the disciples what is the manner, therefore, of prayer that should come up unto him. So Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5, the first point that I want to point out is, and I'll just read them off quickly, we need to love to pray, we need to pray in secret, we need to pray from the heart, and we need to pray to thy Father. We need to pray to our own Father. Love to pray. Verse 5 says, When thou prayest, 
Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray. And I can just leave it there, right? Love to pray, being in love with the aspect of prayer is a good thing. Love is then a strong feeling of affection. We know this. It's, it's one of these where a great interest or pleasure is put on the vessel where we are devoting our love to. Uh, it's a desire. It's a, it's a craving for whatever the object of our love is. Love then that strong, that interest, that pleasure, that desire, that craving for something is what we ought to have with regard to prayer unto God. And the hypocrites here, it's, the problem isn't that they love to pray. Their problem is that they love to pray standing in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. The Bible records here, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So if the reward that they were going for was that they would be seen of men, they got it. Congratulations, you've been seen of men praying. Loving to pray is something, though, that we should have. We should love to pray, not as the hypocrites, not standing to be seen of men, to receive a men's reward, but rather as Christians, as believers, we should want to be seen of God and have God's reward. Wouldn't you agree? The Bible then says loving to pray is then a good thing, but it's about what you love or how you love or how you act out that love. If that love is just a desire to feed self and to grow self, then you'll have your reward here in this earth. But if your love is then directed at prayer, directed at God, then you can grow and see great things happen and you can actually have God's reward for that act of prayer come upon you. Love then, we see, can be grown. And love is grown even in the context of our relationships or, or our, our lives or, or the things that we get ourselves involved in. Love for anything can be grown if we embrace first and forth the right motive with regard to what we are loving. We need to love with the right desire. And we see that in the context of our scriptures. The Pharisees love to pray that they could be seen of men and they could have that same reward, that glory of men. But if we embrace the right motive with regard to loving to pray, that we can be seen of God and we can have God's reward for it, then we're going to grow in that area of love for prayer. We need to take the good feelings then. We need to take the good thoughts. We need to take the positive aspect of prayer and we need to embrace those things. We need to move forward in those things. I think sometimes we find that, that when we're praying, we can, have, we can have good feelings, good experiences. God's really speaking to us and showing us things from the scripture. But then maybe a couple days happens where it's not so positive, where God's maybe revealing things unto us that aren't so good. Or, or maybe, maybe we're just not seemingly getting an, what we want from God. Maybe we're distracted, whatever it is. But if we're focused on the good and the positive and the, the great experiences that we have with God, it'll move us forward to grow in the love that we have for him. Not, being, not, not negating the fact that negatives in the area of prayer can help us, can grow us, and can be something that we can learn to love. But I think in the infant aspect, in the beginnings of our prayer, we need to focus on the good experiences that we are having through embracing God, through the love of prayer that we have for him. We need to then familiarize ourselves also. This is a way to grow in love familiarize ourselves with the object of our love. And how would we do that? We would read about him. We would, we would seek the scriptures where God is glorified. And we would repeat those back to him. We would pray unto him and be like, I, I, I thank God of heaven and earth. I, I thank you that you are the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We can meditate upon these things in prayer and just lift him up, familiarizing ourselves then with the object of our love. And that, that's a way that our love can be grown. And the other way, um, I've, I've heard it often said that, that love is spelled T-I-M-E. Love is spelled with our time. And when we give our time, which really to any one of us is our most precious commodity, our time, our devotion, our, our efforts, everything related around the 24 hours that we have, if we give time specifically to growing in the love for prayer, then I believe the love for prayer will grow. We're dedicating ourselves in that fashion. So we need to then embrace the right motive, have good feelings about it, and then move forward in those, familiarize yourself with God, and give Him your time in the area of prayer. And this is how we can learn to love to pray. It's something that we can grow in. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6 says, But when thou prayest, there it is again, the, it's taken for granted that you will be praying. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, 
And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So here secret is what's being given as the context, as the setting for prayer unto God. He says, go into your closet. Well, that's just a closed space. You're to shut the door behind you. Therefore, we're finding a quiet, a secluded place where we can take part in the activity of praying. And again, there might be some confusion with regard to the scriptures that say pray without ceasing and pray always. Okay, well, we can't, again, just be in that closet all the time. Well, this is more talking about that, that active and devoted prayer. I've set aside, remember how we said love is spelled T-I-M-E. Our love for prayer is, is given a time, given a window of opportunity where we can, we, can, we can give that and devote that especially to God. That is when you would take that quiet place, that secluded place, you would go into your closet and you would shut the door behind you. Now, in the case of praying without ceasing, we could also take the principles that we're learning here about shutting the door and maybe just apply those to the silentness or the, the quietness of our own hearts. Nobody's going to hear what I'm meditating upon within my mind, within my heart, within my being, what I'm praying unto God for. And that's an area where we can, hey, shut the door and we can give God that opportunity to just speak to us in silence within the very meditations of our hearts and of our minds. But both of these cases, I believe, require a certain amount of quarantining of your life. I'm going to set aside, let's say, 30 minutes in the morning where I'm just going to pray unto God. No distractions or anything. The same must be true when we're giving the pray without ceasing window of opportunity for God to act within our hearts. We need to actually set this aside because it's, it's just too easy for us to be distracted. As we go about our day and as things come up, as people call us, as we're called on to do different responsibilities and things that go on, it's hard to maintain that pray without ceasing aspect. But it's almost like you would just give then a closet of opportunity for God within your mind, reminding yourselves always of the opportunity for prayer as you go about that day, and just giving that silent meditation space for you to, to have available for God. Many people have described the mind as this sort of a storage area where there's all different compartments and rooms, and this is how we retain things. The Bible, uh, not the Bible, but scientists have described our mind as to having closets and spaces and compartments that are, that are so far back in the recesses of the overall storage space that maybe we won't bring them up again until something traumatic happens or something piques our, our interest or, or draws that forward. But we can actually compartmentalize our minds. Some people that have uh, mental, dis mental illnesses or things like that, it's because they've compartmentalized a trauma and that only comes up when other outward aspects kind of hinder them or attack them or approach them and then they will kind of uncompartmentalize that problem that they have. But either way, I think we should set aside, yes, the closet at your home, the, the closed space where you can shut the door and pray unto God. But if we were to pray without ceasing, we ought to have a secret place devoted within our hearts that we reflect on honestly and always and try to bring that to our attention. At one point, I set up my watch to ding every hour. And it would ding every hour, and I would just basically kick off that, that hour of prayer. Ding, okay, it's 3 o'clock, most people would do. But ding, that's just an opportunity, that's just a closet. That's an open, an open vacuum of space that I can now use. Ding, okay, there's my reminder to go into my closet and find an opportunity to just quietly pray to God. Hey, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that's going on. Continue to work in my life for this hour. Help it to be an hour that would glorify you. And it's just a reminder to always have that secret place available for God to use and to speak to you in. You can keep your finger there. I'm going to go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Because <clears throat> some people have the idea, 1 Samuel 1, that prayer needs to be, again, that posture. It always has to be that closet. It always has to be that space that we set aside, and we go, and we bow the knee, and this is prayer. But if you look at a specific case, and that's one of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, in verse 9, it says, So Hannah arose, Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest's son sat upon the seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. 
It says in verse 10, And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it shall come to pass... Or sorry, verse 12. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought that she had been drunk. And the story continues. It's revealed that she was, and he grants her the prayer. And in, in the power that he could as a priest, he said he will answer that prayer. But we see then that Hannah, she's speaking there. And her lips are moving, but there's no sound coming out. She's praying entirely and specifically in her heart. She had a secret place of prayer within herself that she had devoted unto God, and that's where she was seeking Him. That's where she was communicating with Him. And I challenge each and every one of us to set aside the same thing, an opportunity, a space, a blank space of remembrance where you can always just... Ding, whatever the cue is, whether it's somebody you meet, whether it's a certain time of the day, whether, like I said, it's my watch going off, just have that space available that wherever you're at, you can pray unto God and just give Him that opportunity to speak unto you and give yourself that opportunity to reach out unto Him. It's, and just a reminder that throughout your day, you need to be seeking Him. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. We'll be back there in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. It says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. This point is pray from the heart. Pray from the heart. We've heard that you need to love to pray. You need to pray in secret. But you also need to pray from the heart. Here, not as the heathen do, is the admonition, the warning there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. Don't pray using vain repetitions as the heathen. They think that their much speaking will give them opportunity to reach God. They'll be heard if they're just saying the same thing, vain repetitions over and over and over again. And I would put the same, uh, the same connotation as the vain repetitions, you know, when people will take uh, the... the uh, Christ teaching to pray, the example prayer, and they'll say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And they'll just kind of repeat that same thing in order that they would be heard of God. Right? The words there aren't vain, but the rep repetition of them is. It's the Bible, okay? But I would also say the same thing as when people will write out their prayers. If they're going to go to a, a big presidential ball or the mayor's visiting or the mayor's visiting somewhere, they'll write out a prayer and then they'll say, Dear God, I, I pray. And they'll just read out this, this great oration unto God. I would consider that also just a vain repetition. You've, you've wrote something now and you're just going to repeat it before God. I don't think that they'll be heard for their much speaking. They heathen repeat the same thing over and over and over or the politician writing out a prayer and then just repeating it back I don't think that just because they're repeating it they're going to be heard rather it's probably going to just hit the roof and fall back down again God wants us to pray specifically from our own hearts and that's the point of verse 7 here he says he says don't use vain repetitions they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking but the opposite is true, and that's that if we pray from our heart, using our own words, personal to the Lord that we're communicating with, as if it was a conversation, and it's real, then I believe that's when we're actually heard of God. Hannah didn't sit there and, and meditate upon all the things before she went down to the temple and prayed them unto God. In fact, to somebody else who was just seeing her words moving, it, was pro it probably did seem like something just unusual. The priest actually thought that she was drunk and it was so strange how she was praying and the things that she was saying. Perhaps she was going this way and that way, but her heart had the same prayer of devotion unto God. And that's how we need to pray. In our own words, personal unto the Lord, you're communicating with, you're talking to Him. When I go home, I don't have what written down what I'm going to say to my wife when I walk into the house. I think she would think it was strange if I was like, Hi honey, how are you doing today? Um, how was Caleb this afternoon? I'm just reading off all these things. That's not how you have a relationship. That's not how you talk to somebody. And God wants us to talk unto him. In the same way, my wife wouldn't hear from my much speaking if I was just like, how are you today? How are you today? How are you today? How are you today? That's what Caleb does, right? And it drives us crazy because he's like, why, 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 why? Right? It's, <laughs> that's not how you properly communicate with me. That, that's toddler stuff. That's, that's, that's baby stuff. That's vain repetitions according to the Bible. 
But we need to communicate with God in, in a real and personable fashion. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8 says, Be ye, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before ye ask him. And that's an important point to make. They think that if they go with a list of things that they need from God, they'll be heard for the much speaking, and it'll be answered. Or they think that if they repeat the same thing over and over, they'll be heard for their much speaking. Now there is some profit in going to the Father, hey, this day and that day and the next day, in earnest, even as Hannah did, and she repeatedly, year after year, went and prayed that same prayer in order that she could get the petition that she asked of him, and it was granted her. There's nothing wrong with going to God with the same uh, desire, with the same need, with the same craving, right? We all have lost loved ones that we pray to God. We don't just pray once, hey, would you pray, Would you, God, would you save my loved one, and just leave it at that. No, we'll probably ask them today, and then the next day, and then the next day. I know people that have prayed for lost loved ones for 40 years, and they just kept asking and kept asking, but they didn't have it written out how they were going to ask. They didn't, they didn't, if you know what I mean, they didn't just vainly repeat the same prayer and expect that their repetition was what was going to hear. No, they trusted that God knew the timing. They were just they were just sort of reminding him. <laughs> they were just sort of meditating upon those things, bringing them up as a way to get them off their heart and put their faith and trust in the God that would grant that prayer. So it says here, be not like them. Well, who are we not to be like? We're not to be like the heathen nor the hypocrites. Just in this short passage, it talks about the heathen, it talks about the hypocrites. It talks about the fools, the unbelievers. It talks about the phonies, those that are, are, are looking as if they're religious and they're righteous, but they're not. It's talking to the heathen, those that are not known of God and don't even know God. And then it's talking also to the hypocrites that think they do. They think they know God. They think that they have that, that direct communication with Him. But we see that both cases, either the heathen are completely just misled and they're doing these vain ritualistic types of things that are trying to get a hold of God, or there's the hypocrites who are trying to be seen of men, trying to have glory of men. They're turning their religion into some outward show of the flesh. And I think we've both come into contact with both types. I think we've acted like both types at times. This is why God had to make the charge. Don't be like unto them. Don't, don't, don't be therefore like unto them as you pray, as you seek me, as you come to your closet, as you come to me in prayer. Don't be that way. Seek me in truth. Seek me in spirit. He says that the heathen and the hypocrites, they're fools, they're phonies. They don't know God, but they think they do. We then, though, are saved. We are his children. We are blood-bought children of the king. We are given access with boldness that we can step before his throne through his beloved son, and we can ask. He knows us. So we need to go believing that he knows us. We need to go trusting that he knows us. Even as a young child will go and they will ask their father for something, we can go to our father and ask the same thing, believing that he will hear us, believing that he wants to hear us. We don't need to have some sort of ritual. We don't need to have some sort of pre-written statement. We don't need to go with much planning to the whole thing. We just need to go to him. That's the statement that we need to grab hold of in verse 8 is, Your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So he knows then our needs. He knows our desires. He knows our cares, right? He knows our pains, our fears, our temptations. God knows it all, and he knows what we need in order to get through the next day. He knows what we need in order to get through the next month. He knows things that are on our horizon that we haven't even considered yet. God is already calculating and working it out and planning the steps of the good man that are ordered by the Lord. He knows all these things, and so we don't need to go and feel like we need to prepare some sort of great oration before him, or an essay, or like a psalm in order to present before God in order to get him to answer our prayers. We don't need to wax eloquent before him. Have you ever heard these people that, that they'll, they'll wax eloquent in their prayer and they'll be like, oh, Father, I thank you, God in heaven and in earth, and uh, I thank you that you are the king of kings, and, the, and, I, and, and I'm so gracious that you... And they, they're going to start quoting Bible verses, and they're just going to start this, this great long... It's like a sermon in their prayers. And I've, and I've heard people that do this. They almost, they almost continue on in their, in their sermon after they, they've, they've preached it, and it's just like a continuation of... You can tell. It's almost like they have notes for the same thing. It's not from the heart. It's not because they deserve desire to get a hold of God. It's not because it's something that's even heartfelt or personal or important to them. Rather, they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking, or they just want to be seen of men. 
It's one of the two things. This is, these are the two types that we see in prayer. They're either praying that they may be seen in men, or they're praying that they would have their own lust satisfied and they'd be heard for their much speaking. But your father knoweth what things he have need of. He already has the list. He already, so when we go to him, it's more for us than it is for him. It's more for me getting my needs off my chest and just putting them away that I can have faith in him, I can trust in him. God, I need to make the next rent payment, okay? I can just say that and just leave it there. I don't have to be spending all this time worrying about it, nor do I have to worry about it so much that before I present it to God, I have to make sure I have all the right words and make sure I have an introduction and a body and a conclusion. It needs to be just fit. It needs to be just the right way so that God will hear it. It needs to be so eloquent and well-worded and all those sorts of things. No, just go to him. He knows that you need to pay the rent. He knows that you need to, to pay the bills. He knows that you need your health taken care of. He knows that you need your family members. He knows all of these things. So don't worry when you go before him, but rather just as a young child would go, we can go and we can seek him and we can ask of him and he will grant these things according to his will. Love to pray. Pray in secret then. Pray from the heart unto God because he knows and he wants these things from you. That's the same point. The next point that I want to make and the, probably the most important is there in verse 6. Pray to thy father, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father. You can just highlight that. Pray to thy father. Pray to thy father. Yes, love to pray. Pray in secret. Pray from the heart, but specifically, pray to thy father. Father. And I love how that's worded because it's not a father. It's not just the father. But then, here we go again with the King James, the these and thous. Pray to thy father. It's personal. It's mine. He's my father. Yes, he is a person. Yes, he is the person, but he is thy person. He is ours. He is specifically and personally our father, if you're saved by grace today. Second Peter 5 and verse 7 says, He careth for you. And this is why we need to cast our cares and our worries and our struggles upon him. He says, cast your cares upon him. Why? For he careth for you. He is your father. He is specifically thy father. So pray unto him. Ask him. Seek him. He knoweth what things you have need of. And the Bible records here in this context that he will reward thee openly. There's two promises that are made, that he knows what you need and wants to provide it. He also will reward thee openly for praying unto him in secret. And this is why we often fall short of prayer, because nobody sees prayer. Nobody sees our prayer life. Nobody sees our devotion. But when I have been really, uh, you know, making ground in prayer, I have personally grown my own faith. And people around me might have no clue, but I'm on cloud nine because God is step by step by step answering all of the things that I talk to him about in the closet. And that is the greatness of going to your own personal father. Look, the way that God answers my prayers isn't necessarily going to be seen by the brothers and sisters in this room. They might not have a clue, but because he is thy father, because he is personally my father, I will see those things. And that's what really helps and strengthens and grows me in my Christian walk. I know he cares for me, and I see it personally evidenced. But if I'm not doing those things, again, the perception is the same. No one knows if I'm riding high in prayer, riding lower prayer, praying always, or praying not at all. These aren't the outward showy works that Christ um, gives and, and pronounces and, and prescribes and commands. This is something that is a heart matter, but it's something that is so important. Again, 545 times you'll find that word pray and the variations of it. It is something that we need to do. We need to ask. We need to seek. We need to reach out. Bible says that we need to love to pray. We need to pray in secret. We need to pray from our own hearts with our own desires unto specifically our Father. He says that he knows what things you have need of. He careth for you, so cast your cares upon him. He will reward thee openly if you do it this way. And he knows what things you have need of, and he will provide them all the same. But we need to have the right heart in the matter, and we need to do things according to the manner given, according to the fashion given. Prayer is very personal, and I think a lot of people might try to verbalize how they do it, or when they do it, or what they do it. There's probably all different types, but the major command that we see is that we need to pray without ceasing. How do we pray without ceasing? Well, that's something that we need to work out with our God. We need to work out with our Father. But we can take precepts that are given 
from this passage of Scripture is Christ says, After this manner, therefore, pray thee. And I tend to go through these and, and learn some things from Christ about the general framework for prayer. Some different things that will help us to, to grow in prayer, to grow in our love for prayer, to succeed in prayer, to overcome in prayer, but specifically the nuts and bolts of it here, Christ gives it to us very plainly, and we can learn from these things, and we can grow in these things. Look, our God desires, even as he did in the garden, to walk with us in the cool of the day. That's why he was out there taking that stroll that morning. He knew Adam had sinned. Adam didn't know where his heart was at, but God took that same walk he always does, and even though it was met with Adam hiding himself, he said, where'd you go, Adam? Where are you at, Adam? What are you doing, Adam? Why are you hiding from me, Adam? And God's doing the same thing to us. If we're hiding from him, every day he's getting up, he's walking in the cool of the day, and he's saying, where are you? Where are you at today? Come seek me. Come find me. God desires that same relationship with us that he had oh so long ago. And it's to the end that we would have a relationship with him. We would grow in the things of God. He would strengthen us in it, and our faith would grow. Because this is what prayer does. Like I said, I go into my closet, and I ask for something in the morning, and it's answered later. I can testify to you. I mean, I've done it before. I couldn't believe it. I found $50, and it was exactly what I prayed for. And a lot of times people are like, yeah. Okay, that's great. But to me, it, it was life-changing. It was game-changing, the events that have happened through prayer and through asking God to move in that way. That's not for everybody else, but that's an inward thing that God does to his own. So pray to thy Father. He's personal, and he wants to be personal. He wants to personally affect your life through the area of prayer. But we need to start with that launch point where it says, when thou prayest. Are we praying today? <laughs> It's taken for granted in the scriptures when thou prayest. It's not an if thou prayest. It's not, you know, did you pray? <laughs> right? No, it's, it's when. So it's, it's something that we will do. It's something that we ought to do. And we ought to be motivated to do more. Because as we go along in this study, we'll see that there's many scriptures that refer to it being always, without ceasing, never ending, continual prayer unto him.